Well, welcome everyone to um, this presentation of the 2005 uh, NDS uh, using allowable stress design and load and resistance factor design. This is part one uh, for member design. Part two on connection design will be covered in a separate section, uh, separate uh, webinar uh, coming up. Uh, my name is Buddy Showalter. I am uh, Vice President of Technology Transfer for the American Wood Council. And uh, you may uh, be aware that uh, we have uh, recently become uh, an independent organization uh, from our predecessor, which was the American Forest and Paper Association. So we've always maintained that identity of, of the American Wood Council within AFPA, but uh, completed uh, our uh, independence in the past uh, several months. And so uh, you may have seen a press release and you'll see new um, websites and, and um, uh, profiles for us uh, coming out in the near future. But um, we're real pleased to be able to present this topic to you today. Um, glad to be working with uh, Woodworks to uh, to do that. Um, let's go ahead and, and uh, get started with a little bit of background on the NDS. Uh, it's been around since 1944 and was originally developed in partnership with the USDA Forest Products Lab and um, then turned over to industry um, in uh, 1944. Um, over the years, um, the NDS has continued to uh, evolve, typically uh, twice a decade, a new edition of the standard uh, will come out. Uh, there were a lot of what they called revisions to the 1944 edition uh, up until 1962 when they uh, started uh, using uh, the year uh, designation to show those major revisions. Um, as you can see here, up through uh, 2001, we have archival uh, versions of the NDS, and we often get requests for those archival versions. Uh, on our website at awc.org, there are instructions for how to obtain those uh, archival copies as well, and so if that's of interest to you, uh, you can find more information about that on the website or email me and I can send you a link to that. Then in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, the industry embarked on a program to develop the load and resistance factor design version uh, of for wood design, and that culminated in the publication of a, a standard in 1995 uh, jointly with the American Society of Civil Engineers and that was incorporated in uh, to the 1996 LRFD manual. So that was around for about a decade and parallel with the, the uh, NDS which was purely allowable stress design until the 2005 version. And then we completed the transition, if you will, uh, and in the 2005 edition, uh, published a dual format standard, which includes both allowable stress design and load and resistance factor design. So that brings us to today's topic, which is the 2005 NDS. Um, I will talk a little bit about the organization of the document. Uh, provide a brief overview of the uh, concept of load and resistance factor design, go through a chapter by chapter description uh, and talk about any changes from previous editions that are worth noting. And along the way, I'll include some design examples. Now obviously in an hour and a half, we can't do uh, the detail uh, uh, with the example problems that I'm sure some of you would, would like. Uh, I will, however, point you to, and, and we'll cover this at the end, but I will point out the fact that with the wood design package that 
the NDS comes with, there are 40 design examples shown in both ASD and LRFD format. Uh, and perhaps in a, you know, in a future webinar, we can tackle uh, a few of those examples in a little more detail. But for today's example problems, they'll be fairly elementary, fairly uh, cursory overview. Um, and again, uh, email or um, provide questions along the way, and we'll we'll let you know whether we can cover that today in the short time we have, or whether that will require a little more research, a little more um, thought to the the answers that we provide. Um, I'll also point out that on our website we have a pretty extensive FAQ section, frequently asked questions, that address many of these uh, topics. And so I may uh, use those or reference to those as a way of answering questions today as well. So let's get started then uh, with the uh, document organization. Um, and for uh, our purposes here today, I'll, I'll primarily refer back to the differences between the 05 NDS and the 01 NDS. I know that that. Some of you out there, especially in, in uh, UBC territory out west, probably jumped right from the 1997 NDS directly to the 05 version because of the code cycle out there. So again, I'll point that to point out that on our website we have a pretty extensive uh, series of what we call e-courses, um, and there is one specifically for the 2001. NDS that you can work through, and that also uh, has the option at the end of providing CEU credits. So if you'd like to get up to speed on uh, changes to the 2001 NDS from the 1997 edition, um, there is an e-course available on our website that can help you with that transition. Um, but when we... Uh, published the 2005 NDS, the, the main change to that document was the uh, incorporation of LRFD. And so we maintain the same uh, chapter uh, headings, same number of chapters, uh, same uh, behavioral equations, almost identical to what we saw before. I'll show you a few uh, distinctions uh, along the way with regard to the behavioral equations. But as a, as a general overview, the first three chapters of the NDS contain the general overview and design provisions and equations. Then chapters four through nine contain the um, provisions for different materials, lumber, glue lamb, eye joists, structural composite lumber, panels, poles and piles. Chapters 10 through 13 contain the, the connection provisions, and uh, we won't be covering those today. Those are also going to be covered in a future uh, webinar. Then chapter 14 deals with shear walls and diaphragms. Also, uh, we'll cover that more extensively uh, in a future webinar. And then 15 and 16 contain some, some specific uh, provisions for special load conditions, and then fire design. There's a series of appendices to the 2005 NDS. Again, we kept that format identical to the 2001 with the addition of Appendix N, which deals with uh, the load and resistance factor design uh, load factors, uh, fee factors, and time effect factors that we'll cover uh, in detail in this presentation. Uh, we'll uh, call your attention to Appendix E uh, for local stresses and fastener groups. That was new to the 2001 version, and that one um, also is is very uh, is, is important and will be covered in the connections uh, webinar coming up uh, next month. The 2005 NDS supplement is integrated uh, into the NDS now as in a single volume. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the design values for lumber, blue lamb, uh, in, in uh, those specific sections of the presentation today. 
So before we actually get started into the specific chapters, I thought it would be helpful to just give a brief overview of this concept of LRFD. Uh, some of you folks who maybe are just out of school uh, have studied this. If you're doing steel or concrete design, you probably have an idea. Um, but I thought it would be helpful to get an idea from uh, the, the wood industry's perspective how um, this methodology was developed. And so we'll spend a few minutes just talking about the LRFD design process and concepts and then uh, the example problems we do uh, will have the comparison to allowable stress design built in. So with either allowable stress design or load and resistance factor design, we know that the capacity of the, the wood member or fastener has to exceed the demand or load that's placed on that uh, member. Uh, the the demand is based on the load, support conditions, geometry of uh, the structure. The capacity also can be dependent on the geometry and then the materials themselves and the performance of those materials. Then we also have other considerations in the design process like fire, uh, economics, and, and aesthetics. So you're probably all dealing with um, all of those components in the design process. But there are two primary limit state concerns in either allowable stress design or, a, or LRFD. One is safety against failure or collapse. And then the second is on serviceability or, or performance in service. Uh, in the area of serviceability, we use uh, unfactored loads. And for material strength, we use the mean or average values. Now that differs from uh, the uh, strength side of the equation where for LRFD we're using factored loads and the material strength values are uh, also modified and that's that's different from what we do in allowable stress design where we're using unfactored loads and the material strengths then have a higher uh, factor safety uh, to cover really the unknowns on the uh, on the load side. But over the years as uh, researchers have looked more closely at the loads, uh, they've developed load factors um, on the load side, then we, we've adjusted the material strength side accordingly. So let's look a little bit then at the um, material property values. Um, as you work from the bottom up on this graph, you'll note that for visually graded lumber, um, we uh, look at that uh, at, the, at the variability, I guess, of that um, product. And if you look at a normal distribution of test values for that product, the, the curve, the normal distribution curve is uh, pretty wide. Um, and so that means that the uh, coefficient of variation is a lot greater for those types of products. As you move up the chart there for MSR, glue lamb, eye joist, finally structural composite lumber, you see that that variability decreases dramatically. And so we'll, we'll look at uh, this in more detail in a, in a few uh, slides uh, hence, but You'll notice that there on the load side um, of the distribution that where those two uh, distributions overlap is the uh, failure zone. And so that's where we operate to uh, maintain the structural integrity uh, of the, the structures that, that we're designing. Um, that overlap or the, the amount of that overlap really depends on uh, a lot of factors and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little more in a little more detail in, in a separate slide. But um, for our uh, products, lumber, engineered wood products, um, panel products, uh, 
uh, we are developing our design values um, based on and um, the lower end uh, tail of that distribution. And so for lumber specifically, we start at the fifth percentile of the distribution before we apply any other safety factors or adjustment factors to those design values. And so again, for either allowable stress design or LRFD, our starting point is that fifth percentile. And we often get calls here about how we can, or how a designer might determine design values for lumber uh, that's not published in the NDS supplement. And we have developed an FAQ on that because it's not a straightforward process. Uh, there's an ASTM standard D245 that's used to develop those design properties. And again, starting point is that fifth percentile. So unless you have all the uh, statistical information for that distribution uh, and, and the values that are published in some sources on the internet, uh, like the, the Wood Handbook from the Forest Products Lab, do publish average ultimate values, but you don't really know the standard deviations, the coefficients of variation for those products, and they're not tied to any grade. And so to, to just say there's a, a factor you could use to arrive at allowable stress design value or even an LRFD value is, is very difficult. And so um, if you're interested in more information on that, take a look at the FAQ section of our website. I think that will give you some, some good uh, insight into uh, how those values are derived and the judgment you would need to make as a designer if you're using those average ultimate values. But again, and I'm not a statistician and I don't play one on TV, but um, I can just briefly uh, give you an overview of how uh, we develop the, the design uh, philosophy. Um, and again, the material resistance curve is shown on the right, the load effect shown on the left. Where those two overlap is the failure zone. Now, we can characterize that uh, zone uh, statistically um, with, with different approaches and there are different distribution curves that are used. Uh, this is a normal distribution, there are Weibull distributions, lots of other uh, curves that can be used to, to characterize this data. And that was all done uh, during development uh, of the allowable stress design properties and LRFD, but we looked closely at it in the LRFD process and uh, tried to make it uh, compatible with what the steel and concrete folks were doing so that as a designer you're, we're not reinventing terminology. So the uh, factor beta shown there is actually the, um, it's actually invisible in the design process, but that beta uh, represents the number of standard deviations away from the mean or the average uh, on these distributions. Um, and it represents that probability of failure. So if you were to look um, at how um, beta works in terms of probability of failure, you see down there for a beta of 2.7, um, that would be one failure expected for uh, 100 uh, structures or members um, designed. And so in the design process, and, and this again is comparable to what steel and the concrete folks are doing. A, a target beta of about 2.4 to 2.9 was chosen and you see the accompanying probabilities of failures associated with that. So again, that's all in the background. You don't see that uh, in the design equations, but what you do see for LRFD are factored loads and those factored loads are represented by this uh, alpha term here. And then on the resistance side, we use uh, a P factor, uh, which is, uh, should be uh, common to um, all materials. It's a factor that you would understand. And then this new uh, lambda factor, which replaces the load duration factor 
we call that a time effect factor. Um, and again, it's designated as, as lambda. And so that's a new term that you'll see if you're designing for LRFD. So what stays the same as allowable stress design? We'll transition now away from the discussion on the background of LRFD to uh, what's comparable to allowable stress design. We did maintain the same basic equation format, the same adjustment factors, you'll see those in the tables, the same behavioral equations with a few notable exceptions, and kept everything formatted for compatibility so that it makes that transition if you do decide to go LRFD as smooth as possible for you. What changes um, is um, some new notation, some Greek notation, uh, lambda, phi, and then uh, an adjustment factor that uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the design loads, uh, which are factored, uh, are bigger. The design uh, loads for serviceability would be the same because those are unfactored. And then for LRFD, the material resistance is going to be bigger um, because we don't penalize that material resistance any longer for the unknowns on the load side. And then, as I mentioned, the load duration factor changes to the time effect factor. I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that the uh, safety margin applied to the material resistance side for um, allowable stress design compensated uh, for the unknowns on the load side. So uh, what you see here is a fairly um, large margin of safety that's applied to the design values. This is the, the design uh, value side on the right side. Um, and again, that's to compensate for the unknowns on the load side. What we've done with LRFD is since we know a little bit more about the loads and there's been a lot more study uh, in that area, ASCE has developed uh, load factors to characterize the probability of those loads occurring simultaneously on the structure. And so since more safety factor, if you want to call it that, is built into the load side, we've been able to reduce the safety factor um, on the resistance side. And that's why you'll see larger loads and larger resistance uh, values as well. The loads that are outlined in the NDS, 2005 uh, NDS, come from ASCE 702. Uh, and uh, these are typical of the load combinations that you'll see in ASCE 7. These are outlined in Appendix N of the 2005 NDS. Also uh, outlined in the um, Appendix N are the resistance factors or fee factors. Uh, for different material properties. And you'll see here that um, these resistance factors um, are lower for the higher, I guess, higher variability products. Um, a 0.65 for connections is a lot higher safety factor, if you will, than you'll see, for example, on um, the compression values, which are easily uh, characterized. Uh, the design values are, are well known, and so the uh, resistance factor doesn't have to, to be as low to characterize um, properties that, that uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of uh, reliability. You'll note that uh, again, in Appendix N, that the load combinations from ASCE 7 are then keyed to the time effect factor shown here in this column. Now, I'll stop and comment a little bit more here on the time effect factor. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, it does replace the load duration factor, C sub D, um, when we go when we move to load and resistance factor design. And we key um, those uh, time effect factors to load combinations similar to what we do in liable stress design. However, the, the one of the big changes is that now the baseline for the time effect factor is not set to a floor load or what we call the normal uh, load. It's now keyed to the lateral loads. So a factor of one, time effect factor of one would be used when you're designing for wind or earthquake load combinations. And then you would use uh, factors of 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, for the roof and floor load combinations, uh, 1.25 for impact. Um, but again, the baseline has changed from allowable stress design. Uh, buddy, we have a couple questions that came in. OK, let's, let's go ahead and uh, stop and take a few of those. I'll start. The first one is uh, probably the easier. Will 2011 NDS based on 2010 ASCE-7? Yes, that is the plan, is to incorporate uh, the load combinations from the 2010 uh, ASCE 7. And um, the uh, question, questioner is correct. The next edition of the NDS will come out at the end of 2011 in time for incorporation of the 2012 building code. OK. And then the next question is, how does beta relate to uh, the failure of the last 500 beams we have designed if we use 0.95 of capacity for design? And I posted that to everyone as well. I'm going to study that question a little bit. I think it was related to uh, a previous slide there. Yeah, it's it's the wording that's throwing me off a little bit here. Oh, if you use a nine five capacity. I'm not sure I understand that question. I I'll ask the the person that that asked that question to maybe send that to me um, separately in, in email. Um, my email address is on our website at awc.org. Um, or uh, an easy email address that we monitor here is info at awc.org. Uh, you can send it there as well. I'm sorry, I, I just don't understand the, the question to, to be able to answer it here today. So any others, Dwight? No, nope, that's it for now. OK, let me move on. So um, in the uh, 2005 NDS, um, for allowable stress design, it's business as usual. No change from previous versions of how you do allowable stress design other than uh, a couple of tweaks to the uh, stability equations, which I'll go over. Uh, for LRFD, the uh, resistance factors, uh, shown here as R sub N, are simple to, to develop based on application of these several new adjustment factors. And these are shown in tables that we'll cover later, but um, phi, lambda, and k sub f are multiplied by those uh, ASD values. The tabulated values are um, ASD values, and so you would adjust those to uh, LRFD using uh, these adjustment factors shown here um, at the bottom of the, of the slide. So the, the format conversion factor, K sub F, uh, is uh, different for different properties. Um, if you're looking at member design, bending tension, shear, compression, uh, radial tension, uh, rolling shear for panels, uh, those strength properties are based on a case of F of 2.16 over phi. The compression perp values uh, are a little bit different, uh, 1.875 over phi. 
this E-min factor, which is new, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, for stability, 1.5 over fee, and then all the connection factors are 2.16 over fee. And those of you who are uh, have, have used this or have looked at it know that it's kind of quirky the way we set this up because that fee factor, which is in the denominator, actually cancels out uh, based on the equation that you're using here. We we realize that um, and are taking steps in the next version of the NDS to to simplify that. So the case of F factors will be simplified in the 2011 NDS. Um, there's a, a an explanation for that that I it's too long to go into here. Again, I'll, I'll direct your attention to the FAQs on our website. We have a specific FAQ in the LRFD section that deals with this question, and so that'll give you a little more background on what's um, what's happening uh, there with that adjustment factor and that that conversion. So why use LRFD? Um, that's a, another question we often get. Um, and let me qualify this response by saying we're not uh, in any hurry to force designers to switch to LRFD. We plan to maintain the dual format um, for the foreseeable future. We know that there's still a couple of generations of folks using allowable stress design, and so we're not going to take that away from you. But if you're if you're designing multiple materials like uh, hybrid structures with steel and concrete, it does make the process a little more straightforward when you can factor all your loads and 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 use LRFD for all those um, uh, materials. Um, it it is a little more rational treatment of the loads rather than penalizing the material strength for the unknown on the load side. You can also realize some efficiencies with the multiple transient live loads. Um, and for extreme event load conditions, um, there there are equations that can handle extreme events like um, fire design as well. The other um, uh, thing that is important to realize is that all you know going forward, all the emphasis in the ASCE 7 load standard is on maintaining the LRFD load combinations. Again, I don't see them doing away with the ASD loads anytime soon, but all the research, all the development and, and um, changes and future enhancements will be on the LRFD side. So that's where uh, the, 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 the research, the emphasis is going to be in the future. So we want to make that uh, available for the design professional. So we'll transition from here to a chapter by chapter description, talk about a few design examples along the way, and then I think leave some time, hopefully at the end, for um, questions, um, if there are some additional questions. Um, again, as we work through the design examples, those will be a pretty cursory uh, review due to time constraints here, but you'll have those in the presentation to look at in a little more detail. So chapter one deals primarily with uh, the terminology. Uh, there are some minor changes there just uh, for semantics, again, to allow us to incorporate LRFD. Um, instead of allowable uh, design values, we're talking about adjusted design values. Uh, and we are now using the term reference design values for the tabulated values that are in the NDS. Again, just to keep a uh, clear distinction uh, in this design process for allowable stress design versus LRFD. Again, the loads are uh, based on ASCE 702, which was the, the uh, last available uh, standard that we had access to in developing the, the 2005 NDS. Chapter 2 talks about um, the uh, different adjustment factors applied to all wood products. Um, so anything that is generally applicable to all products is contained in Chapter 2. Then in the specific product chapters, there may be adjustment factors that are specific to products like lumber or glue lamb, and those are outlined 
in those chapters as well. Uh, again, the low duration factor, C sub D, is uh, comparable to what we call the time effect factor, or LRFD. The wet service factor and temperature factor are um, used for uh, different products. You see the temperature factors outlined there. A uh, question that often arises with temperature factors is, are they applicable to an attic space? And uh, the commentary of the NDS addresses that. Um, and the, the, the quick answer is no, um, because there is that diurnal effect of uh, cooling at nighttime in an attic structure. We don't consider that a sustained or prolonged exposure to high temperature. Um, what these factors are designed for is an industrial setting uh, or a cooling tower where wood members would be um, subjected to those high temperatures for extended periods of time in the form of weeks or months. Wet service factor applies in situations where lumber or wood products will be uh, exposed to, uh, again, prolonged uh, moisture. Um, and that is defined as greater than 19% moisture content. Um, you can see here in this curve that uh, for uh, certain relative humidities and temperatures that the wood equilibrium moisture content shown here on the left uh, can get up in that 20% range um, if you're in a, a relative humidity environment that's above uh, I guess 90 in the 90 to 100 percent range for ex uh, extended periods. So uh, you can see that there are certain climates where that might be an issue. Um, and what you see also in the research is that the moisture uh, effect is not uh, very pronounced on impact strength, which is represented here but does have an effect on modulus of elasticity, um, bending strength, and uh, compression perpendicular to grain. So when we get to uh, the actual factors themselves, you see um, that those factors are based on um, that research. Another common question that we'll get is um, for a covered structure. Let's say you've got a a portico or uh, a, a building out on a uh, recreation facility that has open sides. It does have a roof, a shingled roof or a covered roof, but the underside is exposed to the elements. Would you get um, a wet service environment there? And the response is that except for those really high relative humidity areas, again, in the 95 percent, 95 to 100 percent relative humidity range. If it's a covered roof structure not directly uh, exposed to moisture, then that would not um, be uh, a case where we would uh, apply the wet service factor. Chapter 3 of the NDS then deals with the uh, behavioral equations. And uh, again, for um, the reference strength values represented here, you see that for allowable uh, stress design, it's the tabulated value or reference value uh, times the low duration factor times the rest of the adjustment factors, which are comparable to the adjustment factors used in LRFD. Again, we try to keep those as uh, uniform as possible to ease the transition over to LRFD. As you'll notice, the, the beam stability equation is identical uh, for both allowable stress design and load and resistance factor design. The notable difference here is the um, buckling equation. Uh, 
um, the beam uh, stability uh, factor, F sub BE. And in order to uh, not have different behavioral equations for uh, ASD versus LRFD, we've developed a new um, property, EMIN, uh, that's different from what we used in the 2001 edition. The, there's a paper on our website, uh, it's on the NDS page of our website that provides a little more background on this, but in a nutshell, what we're doing here, and I'll refer you back to the statistics that we talked about um, earlier in the presentation, where we talked about using a fifth percentile value for our um, design values. Um, for the strength design values, bending, compression, tension, we adjust those down to a fifth percentile versus our uh, deflection values or E values, which are an average ultimate value. Since E is used in calculation of um, column or bending uh, or beam strength, um, the, the column stability equations are really an interaction between the, the bending strength and the, the buckling strength or E out in the Euler range. And so since E um, that was published in the 2001 NDS is an average value, in order to use that value in a buckling equation, a buckling critical application, we have to adjust it down to that fifth percentile to make it comparable to the bending value. And so in the 2001 NDS that was hidden uh, in this case of BE factor. Well, we've pulled that out now with the 2005 NDS and created this new factor E min, which is a fifth percentile E value. And so that allows us to use one behavioral equation, make it compatible with both allowable stress design and LRFD because we're operating in that uh, fifth percentile range for both the E value and the bending value. The other um, question that has come up over the years is the, the basis and background for the effective length approach that's used for beam design in the NDS. And so a couple of years ago, uh, AWC developed this technical report uh, we, we called Designing for Lateral Torsional Stability in Wood Members to address that question and to summarize an equivalent uniform moment factor approach that can also be used for uh, beam design. And it combines, it, it provides a comparison of those two. So for more background information on beam design, again, due to time constraints here, I'll refer you to that technical report 14 uh, available on the website. So let's take a quick look at an example problem for a beam, and again, kind of a cursory overview. Um, for uh, serviceability, the, the behavioral equations are going to be identical. You don't factor the loads, um, and so the uh, results for serviceability are going to be uh, almost identical. For uh, safety, we do factor uh, the loads, and that's characterized by this factor alpha here. Um, and that's different from what we do on uh, for allowable stress design where we simply sum the, the loads that are given. For shear, uh, and, and we'll look at three different approaches for uh, a beam design, shear, bending, and, and deflection, uh, which is pretty common. Um, for, let's start with uh, ASD, WL over two, less than two thirds, uh, F sub V times the load duration factor times area. Pretty, pretty straightforward. In the um, LRFD approach, again, we're factoring the loads. 
up, and so we need to factor the resistance up. But you see the behavioral equations are almost identical, with the exception of the lambda phi in case of f factors that are used uh, here. For uh, bending design, again, we'll assume this is a, a simply supported uh, beam with, um, with lateral uh, restraint. Uh, well, I, I guess we wouldn't have to assume that, but we won't show the C sub uh, P factor, uh, or the C sub L factor here. Uh, again, the loads are factored, the resistances uh, are therefore factored, but the behavioral equations are going to be almost identical. And then for our um, deflection design, we're using uh, our average E. And I saw a question came in here, where do you find E min? Um, those are all tabulated in the NDS supplement now. So you're going to have both the average E tabulated alongside the E min value. And I'll show you in a little bit the equation that you can use um, if you want to program it, if you've got your spreadsheets already programmed for average E, I can show you the, the approach that you can use to calculate E min uh, so that you don't have to change your spreadsheets as much if you've got those already developed. So hang on, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Column stability, again, very similar uh, or, or identical, uh, actually, to what you saw in the 2001 NDS. Um, Again, with the distinction here uh, of E min versus E. Again, to allow us to use one behavioral equation, one uh, buckling equation, uh, this allows us to do that and show E min versus E. Uh, we have another question uh, for you, buddy. Okay. I'm uh, uh, going to post it here for everyone. Um, Oops, did I copy it? Oh, the 2006 BC, IBC refers to the ASCE 705 for factored load uh, combinations, while NDS 2005 refers to uh, ASC 7.02. Which do we use, and or is there a significant difference? Um, I don't believe there are going to be significant differences there uh, between the two. I I believe. Um, perhaps in the area of seismic design, I'll have to um, look into that one a little bit more uh, after the call to see um, where the, exactly the changes are, but I don't believe there are significant changes. Um, where, where you do uh, encounter those, um, it should be... Um, permitted uh, to use the same uh, time effect factors that are outlined in Appendix N uh, for those load combinations, uh, even if the load factors uh, have changed uh, slightly or, or the load combinations. But uh, in, in Appendix B of the NDS, we talk about how you apply uh, load duration factors to different load combination. The same principle applies for LRFD, where you would apply the time effect factor to the uh, comparable uh, load combination that contains that uh, shortest duration load. Is that, uh, is that uh, it, Dwight, or were there other questions? That, that was it, buddy. Thank you. Okay. And I think I mentioned earlier the E min uh, equation. And this is it. Um, it's actually outlined for you. And I'm, I'm flipping there now in my NDS to get the right, uh, the correct appendix. But this um, approach is outlined in one of the appendices to the NDS. Um, for lateral stability of beams, it's outlined in Appendix D. And so you can use that equation to calculate your uh, 
your e-min, or you can use the tabulated values that are shown. One more question just came in, uh, buddy. Okay. And I just posted it for everyone. Uh, where does the adjustment factor to convert E to a pure bending uh, basis come from? Are these values located in the NDS somewhere for the visual grade at SD and Glulam, or STL? Yeah, I believe that's also included in the appendix to the NDS, appendix. Appendix D covers that for um, bending values. Um, and I'm looking here for the appropriate chapter uh, for columns that's in Appendix H. And Dwight, I'm looking at the time here. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, getting a little worried about uh, completing this in the time left. I'm thinking we may need to hold questions now until the end okay. and see if we have enough uh, time at the end. That will allow folks, if they need to leave, but, you know, when we end at 2.30 to go, and then maybe we can finish uh, some additional questions afterwards. So if anyone has questions, send them to me, and I will track them all and post them at the very end for Buddy. So carry on, Buddy. Then. Okay, thanks. Um, so for a column example, I think we saw one similar to this uh, for uh, the beams, but um, for liable stress design, we're not factoring the loads. Then we're applying the adjustment factors. In LRFD, we're factoring the loads here based on this factor alpha, and then adjustment factors, but the same um, adjustment factors that we use for, for ASD with the exception of the time effect factor are then used. And then a quick example of a column design, dead load of 5,500 pounds, live load of 31,500 pounds. We'll use a normal load uh, duration or time uh, factor. 16 foot column, we'll consider the ends pinned. Again, factoring the loads uh, or, or not factoring loads for uh, ASD gives 37,000 pounds. Factoring a, a, a typical load case for LRFD. And again, as designers, you know you have to evaluate all loading conditions, dead load only, and then dead plus live, other load combinations. Again, this is a very simplified example. Uh, let's try a 6 and 3 quarter by 9 inch glue lamb. Again, assuming pinned ends, um, slenderness ratio of 28 controls. That would be in that weak axis, six and three quarter inch uh, direction. For LRFD, we use a time effect factor of 0.8 and a load duration of one. Again, that baseline has changed. We'll use uh, unity for the wet service and temperature factors. And so you can see then, as we work through the uh, compression design values that are tabulated, the E and E min are tabulated. Um, we use a, a case of F of 2.4 for compression, 1.76 for stability. And the bottom line, as we work through the, the uh, equations, gives us a uh, capacity for LRFD of 163,000 pounds versus 94,000 pounds for ASD. And I think we'll, one more slide will compare that against, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was just the pure crushing strength, not the capacity. Sorry, uh, I misspoke. That's just the pure uh, crushing uh, strength for uh, F sub C. Then we plug that into the stability equation to get that interaction with E that we talked about earlier, and we see that the, the buckling value uh, then uh, ends up being uh, 1223 for LRFD, 818 for ASD. We see the ratios then are even going to be different uh, compared to the allowables, but the bottom line, um, oh, and then one, one final step, 
Uh, the CSIMP factor then is calculated as, as 69K versus 45 kips for allowable stress design. The bottom line that I was jumping ahead to is that the, that ratio um, of the, the uh, load to capacity is going to be identical. And you'll see this in um, the, the typical um, structures that you designed. And, and this was, again, in the conversion process was done on purpose as a pretty much a soft conversion for the the cases where you've got um, a single live load and a single dead load, uh, you won't see a lot of change in uh, the, the um, results. Where you do see the results is when you get to the multiple transient live loads. If you have a floor load or several floor loads plus a roof load coming down on a header in a first floor, for example, because of the load factoring, and the load factoring is really looking at the probability of occurrence of those multiple transient live loads on the structure. Because of the load factoring, that's where you'll see the enhancements to LRFD. So I, I often tell people, if you're doing multi-story uh, design, where you've got um, several floors, uh, in, where you're going to see the advantages in your first floor uh, members, your columns, your headers, um, that's where where the efficiency will be gained for uh, design using LRFD. Attention members, I'm going to fly through these because uh, we've seen the format already, load duration factor versus time effect and the other adjustment factors. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is, and, and that we, we get questions about often is tension perpendicular to grain. We don't uh, recommend it. Uh, we urge designers to do everything possible to avoid it. Uh, you need mechanical reinforcement uh, if you can't avoid it. But that's uh, really a weak link in wood design that we say for both uh, member design and connection design you want to avoid at all costs. We don't have time to really do justice to combined biaxial bending and axial compression or tension, other than to say, again, the behavioral equations are the same. So if you've got your E min values that you're using, uh, it's going to be a pretty straightforward approach for ASD versus LRFD. For bearing perpendicular to grain, uh, again, it's going to be identical to the 2001 NDS with the exception of uh, adjusting your uh, capacity. So then let's jump to some of the specific uh, product chapters. Lumber covers visually graded, MSR, timber, heavy timbers, and decking. Um, this table you'll see repeated over and over again in various chapters gives you a real quick snapshot of what adjustment factors apply. If you're doing allowable stress design, then you, you use from here, low duration, over to the bearing area factor. If you're doing load and resistance factor design, you start here with C sub M and work your way across here. And so again, you can see um, that we've made this as straightforward as possible for the designer uh, in designing uh, with LRFD. All the factors that you're accustomed to for size, flat use, and sizing, buckling stiffness, are identical to the 2005 NDS flat use uh, or the fact the uh, size factors and flat use factors have not changed from earlier editions. And sizing factors are used for uh, what we call refractory species. That's another common question. Um, what's the incising factor? That's when we cut small incisions into the lumber to get the chemicals to penetrate. And for most other softwoods other than southern pine, that's what's required to get the preservative treatment to penetrate. When you cut those incisions, it affects the uh, strength of that three-quarter inch of uh, surface area that is, uh, is incised. And so these adjustment factors account for that reduced cross-section, basically, in the member due to those incisions. Competitive member factor is used for uh, 
two to four inch thick lumber and um, used in repetitive member applications with a load distributing element. We've eliminated the form factor that was used in older uh, versions of the standard um, derived from uh, plastic deformation in, in small clears and that may not be applicable to full size members. It's certainly not applicable to eye joists and other um, engineered wood products. So that has been removed. And again, for a, just a real simple example for a common case where you might have unincised lumber axially, axially loaded uh, in a normal environment, you see that a lot of these adjustment factors for um, uh, flat use and in sizing, repetitive member, they all go to one, they all go to unity. And so you end, you end up with just a few adjustment factors that you would apply in the design process. The ASD manual that is included in the package uh, shows some of these examples as well if you'd want to use that as a resource. We'll talk a little bit about finger jointed lumber in, in this product section. Um, it is uh, accepted as a, an alternate to uh, dimension, regular dimension lumber. Uh, it's interchangeable. There are some new designations for heat resistant adhesives that we'll talk about. Um, in uh, fire rated assemblies or where a fire rated assembly is required, you'll need to start looking for a grade stamp that includes this designation HRA or heat resistant adhesive. Um, that's based on some tests that were done where we saw that the adhesives used in here or certain adhesives used uh, in finger jointed lumber um, would, would qualify in a fire uh, assembly. There are certain adhesives that are used that don't qualify. And so um, if you don't see, or if you see a great sense as non-HRA, then you would keep those out of your fire rated wall or floor assemblies. If it doesn't show up at all, then you consider it to be a non-HRA, non-heat resistant adhesive. The other stamps that you'll see on finger jointed lumber include uh, exterior use and um, so the you could use those um, in, in uh, exterior applications. Um, then you'd see uh, stud use only. Um, that would be used uh, where bending or tension stresses are of short duration. Um, Sometimes you'll see the designation vertical use only as well. If you have a piece of finger jointed lumber, it's been put together sometimes from lumber that was cut, let's say, in trust, the trust manufacturing process. There may be an old grade stamp that's on that piece of lumber. Those old grade stamps have to be obliterated and the new grade stamp added because putting those two pieces of lumber together may change the grade of that product. For glued laminated timber in Chapter 5, uh, we've added some uh, new design values to the NDS supplement. We've added radial tension values as well, and some of the shear values have gone up in the 2005 edition. Here's where you see the addition of the radial tension values. They used to be shown in the text of Chapter 5, um, but we've tabulated those now. Um, you're probably familiar with the um, volume effect factor C sub V. Um, I'll just point out that again that's shown in the table but it's not cumulative with the uh, beam stability factor C sub L. Uh, so you need to calculate both and use whichever controls, whichever the smaller of the two values is would control. And then again the typical uh, adjustment factors that are used for glue lamb are still there. The curvature factor applies to bending to the core, curve per portion of a bending member. Again, an example where for an actually loaded compression member in a normal environment, a lot of the factors go to unity, and so it's a real straightforward um, conversion. 
Poles and piles are in Chapter 6. Those are unchanged from the 2001 NDS. Um, and we provide design values for both timber piles and poles graded in accordance with ASTM D3200. I'll note there that there is a, another, another grading standard that's used for uh, utility poles. Uh, it's an ANSI, I think, 05.1 standard, if I'm not mistaken. So um, they have their own design procedures and values. So if you're going to use the NDS to design those poles, they'd have to be regraded in accordance with this standard. And again, a table that shows up in all these chapters that show the applicable adjustment factors for different products. For poles and piles, there are three factors, untreated, critical section, single pile. Again, they're all shown there unchanged from the 2001 NDS. And another example, I know I'm flying through this, folks, but I'm looking at the time, and um, we're going we're gonna to end up short here. I'm sorry. Uh, iJoyce remain unchanged from the 2001 NDS, and um, so we tabulate MV and uh, EI um, provisions there and show the applicable adjustment factors to actually get the design values. You have to go to the manufacturer's evaluation report to, to get these MV uh, EI values out of their evaluation reports. Uh, one slight change here, I think, was to the C sub R factor that's used for iJoist. Um, it was re revised down to one uh, based on ASTM D5055, but we kept it in there just to transition from the 2001 NDS so you wouldn't think it was a typo and it had been deleted for, for some reason. It is one. It will probably go away in the next edition, but um, it's, it's there to, to show that transition. And again, uh, for fully laterally supported bending member in a normal environment, you see the, the adjustments are very straightforward. Structural composite lumber, you saw this earlier, a um, lot less variability than, than lumber and other products. And the values are contained in the, in the um, manufacturer's evaluation reports. And again, as with glue land, the, the volume factor is not cumulative with the um, beam stability factor, C sub L. There is a C sub R factor for structural composite lumber. It's 1.04. And again, point out that that's different than the value for lumber, which is 1.15 applied to the bending value. Another example there for a fully laterally supported bending member in a normal environment. For wood structural panels, um, we've incorporated again the methodology here to show uh, ASD versus LRFD. Uh, the adjustment factors are found in the either the NDS commentary or um, the uh, ASD LRFD manual that's included with the package. And uh, this is an example that tabulated values in the manual designated uh, with the M here, it stands for manual, and that's one part of the package that, that you've got in addition to the NDS. Again, these adjustment factors are all spelled out in Chapter 9 of the NDS. And another example for uh, a typical uh, application for structural panels. Again, fact, uh, fasteners won't be covered in this session. That will be covered in the September 30th presentation. Um, chapter 14, dealing with shear walls and diaphragms, again, will be covered in a future uh, presentation. Uh, that one's coming up on October 14th, where we'll cover uh, the wind and seismic standard. For built-up columns in Chapter 15, again, very similar to what was shown in the 2001 NDS with a few minor uh, details uh, and clarifications. And then for uh, fire design, uh, Chapter 16, that only applies at this point to uh, allowable stress design, um, but you can design uh, 
mem uh, columns, beams, uh, tension members, combined loading for uh, up to a two hour fire resistance. The background for that is in a technical report that's available free on our website uh, called TR10, Calculating Fire Resistance of Exposed uh, Wood Members. What the approach basically does is it looks at the charring effect and, and provides a, uh, an, an analysis based on this outer layer of the beam charring away and leaving an insulated, really uh, still structurally sound member that can still resist uh, the load. So um, when we uh, use this approach, we basically build sacrificial wood into the member. So you would build into your design this amount of product, say in a four-sided exposure, which would then leave this amount after the one or two hour exposure left to carry the design load. And so in a nutshell, that's the design approach that's used. I'm going to probably have to skip ahead. I had a design example here. Um, that, that I was going to go through, but uh, and for the interest of time, I'll let you look at that on your own. This is the design approach that's used and is outlined in Chapter 16 of the NDS. This characterizes the, uh, the uh, charring effect, and uh, the, the rule of thumb is that wood chars at an inch and a half per hour, and so for that inch and a half per hour char rate, you can see the effective char layer develop for those different fire endurance uh, procedures. And so um, I'm going to skip ahead now. I apologize, but we're going to have to do that in, in um, interest of time. Um, so look at that design example there in the fire section um, on your own. Again, uh, the NDS appendix is shown uh, here. Um, Appendix E will be covered in the connection section, and Appendix N, uh, as we mentioned earlier, covers the LRFD approach. Uh, and I've covered that. I'm not going to reiterate. The NDS supplement was updated to include the latest reference design values for visually graded lumber, mechanically graded lumber, and glued laminated timber. Uh, we mentioned earlier that the EMIN value uh, is tabulated there now. Um, in the NDS supplement, or you can calculate that based on your E-average values. We've added a couple of new species to the NDS supplement, Alaska cedar, Alaska hemlock, Alaska yellow cedar, and bald cypress in the dimension lumber table, or heavy timber, just a couple of those species show up. And then table 4F uh, contains several new um, non-North American species as well, if you're seeing any lumber coming in from outside of the country. Um, there's some new uh, footnotes that give additional shear, specific gravity, and compression perp values for some various grades of MSR and NEL. And again, EMIN is published for those MSR and NEL values as well. This is a summary of what's included now or what's changed in the GLULAM section of the supplement. So there's some new EMIN values and a new stress class that's been added. And um, just some other enhancements here. Again, I'll let you take a look at that on your own time. I'll, I want to leave a little bit of time here for questions at the end. So um, one of the changes we made as well was incorporating the NDS, supplement and the commentary all into one volume. We've gotten good feedback uh, from the design community on that to, to consolidating those and we'll maintain that in the future as well. Um, so there are four parts to the, the package, the NDS and the, the special design provisions for wind and seismic. Again, that's coming up in a future seminar. The manual, which contains a lot of background information, uh, including a lot of fire design information and all the chapters there are keyed to the chapters in the NDS. And then again, I'll point out the workbook, which has some extensive example problems 
that you can use um, to see the straightforward approach uh, for allowable stress design versus LRFD. And we've covered a broad range of examples, beam design, column design, almost every kind of connection design, and even a couple of uh, shear walls uh, and diaphragms at the, at the back of the example book. So uh, use that as a resource as well. And again, maybe in a future seminar, we can look at some of those pretty specifically. And I've already covered what's, what's in the manual and the example problems. And these are just summaries of what we've talked about today. So I'm going to stop there and left about five minutes for questions. So um, let's um, see what, what's come up, Dwight, and we'll try and address some of those. I have a couple of uh, questions for you, buddy. Uh, this, let me go back up here. Uh, first off is, uh, where can I purchase the 2005 NDS pack? Oh, OK. Um, go to awc.org under uh, standards, click on NDS, and it gives you the option to buy either hard copy or electronic version. And then the next question I just posted, 2006 IBC does not allow for repetitive lumber adjustment. Does NDS uh, supersede this? Yes. The NDS is adopted as a reference standard in the IBC. You'll, you'll notice a trend in the IBC where a lot of the information that was transcribed into the code is being replaced by reference standards. And um, so uh, the information for repetitive member factor as well as low duration factors that were uh, sort of different in previous versions are all now included in the NDS and are referenced in Chapter 23 of the IBC. Great. And then the next one I'll post right now is, does the incising factor CI apply to all preservative treated lumber? No. It only applies to what are called refractory species, um, which are basically they're just hard to treat. The, it's hard to get the chemicals to penetrate. Um, so I think there are two softwoods um, that are commonly used out there, red pine and southern pine, that uh, really absorb the, the preservatives well and get the penetrations that are required per the uh, standards. The other species like dug fir, hem fir, spruce pine fir that are commonly used, if they're going to be preservatively treated, typically are going to require that incising. And that's all the questions I've received so far. OK, well, we finished pretty much on time. So I want to thank everyone for participating here today. Uh, again, uh, the email address that um, we use here for most of our technical inquiries is info at awc.org. And typically, when we do a presentation like this, either live or with, with the webinar, we'll see a spike in those requests. So please be patient with us <laughs> as we uh, work through the responses to those. You, I may not get a response today or tomorrow, but you'll, uh, we will eventually respond to all of those. I might also mention that, we all, that, like everyone, we have spam filters. So if you don't hear back from us at all, it's not that we're ignoring your question. Um, you know, give us a call if, if we didn't receive it, and we'll find out if it got caught up in a spam filter and, and make sure that uh, you can get through to us. Okay. Uh, thank you, buddy. One last question before we uh, we go, and then we can go to the next slides about the upcoming webinars. Uh, did I understand that designing with number two SYP, either uh, preservatively treated or not, we would use the same design values? Yes, that is correct. Uh, southern pine uh, is uh, not it does not need to be incised to uh, accept treatment, so the incising factor is not applicable. And um, the design values for preservative uh, versus unpreservative treated uh, lumber are the same. The only time you see um, adjustments to uh, design values for treatment typically comes with the fire retardant treatments. 
then another question I just posted there, uh, do you have reference for HRA versus non-HRA? Um, yes. Uh, on our, again, on our website, um, there is a uh, uh, FAQ, and if I can get to it quick and quickly enough here, I will um, post that link um, as a response uh, to the uh, question. But if you go to awc.org, go to the um, FAQ section, uh, you'll see um, that information posted there. Let me see if I can put that up. While, while you're doing that, buddy, can you also post the uh, AWC uh, request uh, info email? There's a request for that as well. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Put that link. Actually, let me just get to the help desk link here. And this, um, the help desk index link will get you to um, the email address and the phone numbers and all that other stuff uh, that we use. And then uh, one last question, which I'll uh, post right now. Um, if the load capacity ratio as, as same as LRFD and ASD that you are not benefiting in terms of material if you use LRFD as you stated earlier. Okay, let me, yeah, let me try and clarify that a little bit. Um, what I mentioned was that for simple designs where you're just looking at dead load plus maybe one live load, you likely will not see uh, much benefit. However, if you have multiple transient live loads, let's say you've got two floors and a roof, then when you start factoring loads down through that structure, that's where you see the benefit. The load factors are what are really giving you the, the, the benefit because they're accounting for the probability of simultaneous live loads, simultaneous transient live loads occurring on the structure. So I like to state it like this, if, if um, let's say you're in a two-story structure um, and, you know, you're on the, the first floor and um, there is, you know, what, and you're at a, a party and you're wall-to-wall -wall with people, you know, your first floor is loaded, but what's the likelihood then that your second floor is going to be fully loaded and your roof is going to have a full design snow load on it? Um, those load factors are, are what are accounting for the the probability of the simultaneous occurrence of those those maximum loads on the structure, and that's where you start to see the benefit in LRFD. And um, oh, it looks like a couple. Uh, should we design? Oh, jumped on me. Sorry about that. Should we design the mud seal for in, the incising factor anchor pole? I'll post that too. While I'm uh yes let me think yes uh, let me go let me go back quickly to see what um, that what uh, properties the incising factor will apply to that's in chapter four and for FC per the Factor is one. Um, so for uh, fastener design, um, the answer is no. It does not affect the dowel bearing strength of the fastener. So you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily adjust your anchor bolt capacities for that, since the compression perp value uh, for the incising factor is one. It wouldn't affect your bearing strength. Um, if you are designing that sill plate for bending, I guess, for any bending due to, a, like, uplift, uh, maybe a hold down uplift in the corners, you, you could potentially do that. But I don't think that's typically done since that's all sort of part of the shear wall design. So 
I don't think that incising factor is necessarily going to apply to any properties um, that I can think of for uh, for a sill plate. And in general, I'll post this here as well for you. Um, in general, in designing single-story structures, is there significant advantages to using LRFD? No. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, and and I just don't want to keep repeating myself. It's, it's it, it really does not. And that's all the questions I have, I believe. I do want to thank you, buddy. If um, uh, appreciate everyone uh, sticking in here and uh, asking the questions, and again. Uh, I'll uh, actually ask Buddy just to go to the next slide and uh, let you know where, where we can be reached in some of the upcoming webinars. So these are the uh, upcoming webinars that AWC is putting on and the ones that we have coming up as well for Woodworks. Um, and uh, you'll find those on. Uh, Buddy, have you posted yours to your website? I can't remember, Dwight. I'll have to okay. check, but I think. Since you just asked me that question, I'll probably make sure I get them up there today or tomorrow. <laughs> okay, because what I'm going to suggest, uh, if you're interested in those ones, uh, you should be able to find them on either of our websites. And uh, the next slide will tell you where to find those. You can just click to the next one. And